You were telling me about a girl that sent you an email shortly after your book came out saying that she hadn't gotten asked out for six months. And then after she read your book and started to put some of your recommendations into action, she got asked out like five times. Yes. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. We are in a new set. I hope you guys like it. We've been working really hard on this and there's going to be a lot more that we're going to be putting on the walls that are special things. So keep watching the set evolve, but I hope you guys like it. Today, we're going to sit down with Rachel Hoover Canto. I just read her book and I was blown away, actually. My brother-in-law, who is dating women right now and trying to find his future wife, he told me about this book and he said, this is the best dating book I've ever read, this book by Rachel Hoover Canto. And I read it and I said, you're right. This is the best dating book that I've ever read too. And I've read a lot of them when I was in my 20s trying to find my husband. I feel like meeting, dating, and marrying my husband, Joe, was like getting the last chopper out of Nam. I'm so glad that we got married. And I feel so bad for a lot of people today that are trying to find the one because it's really hard out there in the dating world. This episode is for you. I think Rachel does a phenomenal job in making it really practical and even easy to take steps to find somebody, discern whether or not they are the one, get them to ask you out if you're the woman, actually hopefully get married one day. She lays it all out in this awesome book, which is called Pretty Good Catholic, How to Find, Date, and Marry Someone Who Shares Your Faith. Spoiler alert, you don't have to be Catholic. You can be Christian or anybody, and this book is going to help you. Also, if you are about to turn this off because you are already married, or maybe you're dating someone happily and you don't need to keep dating, you feel you have a good boyfriend or girlfriend, and you're like, I don't need this advice, don't do that. Keep listening. This advice will help you help other people, and don't forget to share this episode with a friend. All right, Rachel Hoover Canto, thanks for joining the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. You are the first person officially on this set, so thank you for coming out and being here for that. I love the set. It's beautiful. Good, good. And you came all the way in from? Nashville, Tennessee. Nice. How is it out there? It's good. It is much muggier there than here, so I'm kind of enjoying the dry heat and good. walking around outside. That's nice. Good. Well, I'm really glad you're here because my brother-in-law told me about you, so it was the first time meeting you. And he was like, this is the best book. He's single, he's dating, he's trying to find his wife. And he said that your book, which just came out, is the best book that he has ever read on dating. And he's read a lot of books. That is high praise, but that's exactly what I was hoping for. I was writing it from this perspective of trying to write the book that I wish I had had about 10 years ago when I was just starting to date. And um, from the feedback from readers so far, it seems like I succeeded for a lot of people. So praise be to God. Awesome. Well, and I read it and I thought he's right because I've also, and in my twenties, I read all the dating books and I thought you nailed it again and again and again with just the right advice that people need to hear. So I'm very excited for this conversation. I'm excited too. All right. So before we sat down, you were telling me about a girl that sent you an email shortly after your book came out saying that she hadn't gotten asked out for six months. And then after she read your book and started to put some of your recommendations into action, she got asked out like five times. Yes. Uh, she's actually the leader of a, a young adult group close to my hometown, and she wanted to have me come speak. And she was telling me on the phone how this book had already impacted her life. She just read it. She really wanted to bring it to more people. And I was blown away by that testimonial that it just helped her change her mindset that much that she was able to kind of signal to these men who may have been kind of waiting in the wings anyway, but didn't know if she was open. And she was, and all of a sudden she was getting all these dates. So it was a really good uh, witness to just the power of changing your mindset a little bit and your uh, behavior toward other people. And sometimes that's all it takes to kind of um, drop the hanky. It used to be the old fashioned phrase, but just let guys know that if they asked you out, you wouldn't shut them down. You know, they can be a little afraid of rejection naturally. <laughs> and so that was that was just really good to hear that she was able to, to kind of get that first step started. All right. So your book, you give advice to both men and women. So it's not like yes. it's just for women or just for men. But what advice was it that she got that helped her change her mindset, as you say, to move from not being asked out for six months to having five dates lined up? I recommend a lot of just very subtle changes. If you're going about your daily life, you're probably running into people all the time but we have this mentality now that we're not supposed to talk to strangers and that we're not supposed to just kind of smile at people and make eye contact and make it obvious if we're interested in someone, I think. And so I, I just recommend 
not, I mean, partly going to new places that maybe you aren't normally going to, meeting new people, getting those numbers up, so to speak. Um, but also everywhere you go, just having a, maybe a challenge for yourself. I'm not just going to go here and kind of sit in the corner with my friends and ignore everyone, but I'm going to go and actively try to meet at least one new person of the opposite sex and just have a nice conversation. And maybe it goes nowhere, but maybe it does. So I think things like that, um, even just practicing by, you know, chatting with your cashier a little bit, how's your day going, you know, (laughs) just sort of politeness, you know, being a little extra friendly, I think can help us get over some of that social anxiety. And then for women in particular, when you are actually interested in someone, you have to take that friendliness level and just dial it up to 11 and go way beyond what you think is a normal amount of eye contact or a normal amount of, <laughs> you know, smiling and laughing. I mean, not not to be fake at all, but to just make sure you're not holding back or holding in your interest. Let it show on your face and in your body language, um, because men really need those strong hints to know that the door is open and they can come knocking and they could ask you out. Um And also, I think we have a lot of fear sometimes of just taking that initial step because we don't know enough about the person. I don't know if this is someone I would really want to marry or date long term. And I say that's exactly what a first date is for. So being as open as possible to first dates is a really good idea so that then you know something about the person and you can decide if you want a second date and a third date and just take it one step at a time. Okay, there's a lot already that you said that I think is very useful information, but I want to deep dive a little more. And then I want to actually go through, this is your book right here, Rachel, and we're going to link it in the episode description so everybody can get access to this special book, which is very valuable. And there's 11 chapters, and we're going to go through some of these key chapters with core advice. But I wanted to start with the advice you were just giving about how to even up your lead generation, so to speak, in the opportunities to go on dates so you can start that funnel process of meeting people. And then that's the only kind of pathway to ultimately hopefully getting married one day. A lot of people want to do that. Um, highly recommend marriage by the way, but you said something about as the woman, the importance of showing interest and you don't have to want to marry them yet. Just like, is this someone that you could potentially be interested in? So don't be so picky that it has to be, you know, the perfect man, six foot two and you know, of all these statistics eyes, already, all, finance career, all yeah, that. all of that, right? Um, but you, you, you said something about being extra friendly and having this. You know, not. I think you said ratchet up past ten. What was the language? Turn you it used? up to eleven is what Turn I it up to say, whatever okay. that. What whatever does your that starting look like? Because I think maybe girls listening are like, okay, some girls maybe are like used to. They can be flirty. They're comfortable with that. But mm-hmm. basically, you're saying to be flirty in an appropriate way, or yes. friendly is the better word. What yes. does that actually look like? It's a little different for each person. It has to go with your personality. I don't want to advocate doing something really regimented that comes across fake, but I think for especially people who tend toward being a little shy, um, sometimes having some very concrete things that you can remind yourself to do is helpful. So things like when you're having a conversation, actually like turning your entire body toward the person, including your feet, that's a way to signal, I'm interested in this conversation and would like to stay in it. I'm not trying to run away. Mm. Um, But that's something, I mean, I subconsciously will end up kind of (laughs) turned outward toward the room or something or not, you know, looking someone in the eye and eye contact. Um, I I actually know a couple who met in a grocery store parking lot and now they're married happily. After reading this book. Well, (laughs) the way it happened was that she saw this cute guy across the parking lot and just thought, I'm going to make eye contact with him just a little longer than is normal with a random stranger and just see what happens. And he noticed and he walked over and started a conversation and that's all it took. So if you think you're making enough eye contact for a normal conversation, just add a little more. (laughs) And that shows you're really interested in this person. You're really focused on them. Um, I always hear about some of the saints, like Mother Teresa, for example, was known for making everyone she met feel like the only person in the universe while Mm. she was having that conversation. And there's a matchmaker I know, her name's Christina Pineda. She uses that same advice for dating. Again, not to be artificial, it's part of loving your neighbor in a way to just focus on someone, but it's also really helpful for showing a man (laughs) that you might be interested in him, you know, just make Mm. him feel like all your attention is on him for that moment. And then of course, if you end up not being interested, you can direct your attention elsewhere. You know, it's not a permanent decision to to just kind of focus in on his face for a little while. Um, 
I think laughing is great. I think a lot of men really feel affirmed when their jokes are funny, you know, that helps. And then even depending on the situation, how well do you know this person and find him trustworthy, being able to, you know, physically like lean a little bit closer to him if you're sitting close together, things like that can kind of signal interest as well. Um, so those are some really concrete, specific things. There's probably a multitude of other ways that you can also signal it that might just come organically from your personality and you can just roll with that too. WeHeartNutrition.com is a wholesome product with wholesome values. This is a vitamin company which designs its product with the highest quality ingredients that are research-backed specifically for wherever you are at in your life. So if you are a woman just seeking an everyday vitamin, WeHeartNutrition.com has got the best product for you. If you are seeking to conceive, you're hoping to get pregnant, they've got a product for you. If you are pregnant, they've got a product that's a great prenatal vitamin for you. If you've just had a baby and you need to replenish all of those depleted vitamins, vitamins in your body and minerals in your body, they've got the best product for you. We Heart Nutrition has got you covered wherever you are in your stage in life. And what's awesome about this company is it's not only an American-based company and a small family business, but they support your values. Did you know that a lot of the vitamins that are sold online or in the store are owned by conglomerates that actually oppose and hate family values? Not so with We Heart Nutrition. WeHeartNutrition.com actually donates a full 10% of its sales back to the pro-life movement, supporting moms and babies in need. So stop buying your vitamins from some big conglomerate that doesn't support your values, but instead go to weheartnutrition.com today, find the vitamin package that best fits the needs and where you're at in your life and order these amazing vitamins to help you thrive. That's weheartnutrition.com and you can use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your first order. That's weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. What if yeah. someone listening right now is like, okay, that all sounds good, but I'm afraid of rejection. That guy, I have a huge crush on him or maybe they meet a guy and they're super attracted to him, but they're like, I don't know if he'd be interested in me. How do they, how do you, how would you navigate that? What advice would you give? It's hard. I mean, rejection is always really painful. And I think oftentimes we focus on the pain of rejection with men, because if they're the ones doing the asking out, then they're the ones getting a really flat no or getting ghosted maybe a little more often. But you can be rejected in a more subtle way. Or maybe maybe the guy does just say to you, I'm not interested. And that's really hurtful. <laughs> stop <you> know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> stop, so, laughing stop flirting with me. <laughs> yeah. But I think... I say in there, I, I, I'm saying it more to the men, but it goes for women too. I say somewhere in the book, it only takes one yes to make all the no's worth it. Mm. So even if a hundred people have rejected you, <laughs> the one right person mm. who comes along, who ends up being your spouse and you have this wonderful, happy life together, you will look at all those rejections mm. ultimately as gifts. A little bit like when we get to heaven, we hope <laughs> we get to sort of see all of our past sins, mistakes, suffering as completely redeemed in Christ. Mm. It's it's a little taste of that, I think, here on this earth. I mean, I went through some rough breakups before marrying my husband, and now I'm so glad that all those guys broke up with me because <laughs> it means that I got to marry him, mm -hmm. and I'm so happy with him, and he's exactly the right person for me. So I want to offer that as hope, sort of light at the end of the tunnel. It's all going to be worth it in the end. But if we're not willing to take risk of rejection, then we're never going to risk the yes, in mm -hmm. a sense. You know, you have to give... Um, give a chance both ways and, and just hope for the right outcome. One more question on that point. If you're a woman and you're thinking, okay, sure, this sounds nice, but I don't want to pursue a man. I'm not, I want him to pursue mm -hmm. me. I don't want to be the one pursuing. What mindset would you encourage her to have that these gestures she's making or her engaging someone in conversation or even being the first one to make eye contact, that that's actually not pursuing, mm -hmm. that is merely being open and creating space for someone to pursue? Yes. I would say uh, I heard it from the men that I talked to for this book that they usually need a lot more hinting than we think they do. <laughs> they wish that more women, especially in the Christian and Catholic world, would show their interest so that they know that she's open to pursuit. I think a lot of them have been um, kind of conditioned to think that they, they might come off as creepy if they start pursuing a woman who's not interested. She might even get angry. I hear stories of men, you know, all the time, they just try to tell someone she looks nice or, or actually a man told me once, I feel like I can't even tell a girl that she looks nice these days because that could be considered sexual harassment. 
which is not true. It's not sexual harassment to compliment a woman on, you know, your, your outfit is so nice today. That's perfectly fine. But I understand why men have gotten a little mm. fearful of doing some of those things that we would actually like them to do. So it, there's just a lot of ways on both sides. We need to meet each other in the middle a little more. And I think pursuit is, can I have your number? Can I take you out on a date? It's those very concrete things. Mm. I do advocate for leaving that to men. I think everything just tends to go better if the man who's really very interested is willing to kind of put skin in the game and take the direct approach. But I, even my husband told me the first few times he interacted with me, he was interested, but he was not getting good signals from me <laughs> at all. And so he didn't do anything direct until he had more of an opening. And he later told me, you just got to give me something. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to barge in there and try to force it. I'm going to wait till I see some indication that I might get a yes. And I think that's true of most men. So you're not pursuing just by uh, showing that there is a door there to be knocked on, so to speak. <laughs> it's, it's just the very, very initial foundation work that is perfectly fine for both men and women to participate in. And let's say you're opening this door nice and wide frequently with this guy that you have a crush on. The point there, though, would be if he's not asking, then go find someone else. Yeah, eventually, I think if you've really, really sent a lot of strong signals <laughs> that could not possibly be mistaken, um, maybe stronger than you thought you needed to send initially. Uh, I do think eventually it's true that a man who is interested and ready for a relationship will mm. pursue. Yeah. Sometimes he might be kind of interested. He might even be kind of flirting back, but he's just not in a position in his life where he's ready to start dating someone. Mm. It could be financial reasons. It could be he's in school or starting a new career or mm. something. Whatever it is, there's some reason why he's not taking the bait. And so just <laughs> focusing your energy elsewhere, you know? <laughs> yeah. And this is part of why I think it's good to not necessarily restrict yourself to being so focused on just one person and getting too hung up on a crush where nothing has happened yet. It can be really hard. Mm. You know, we have feelings we can't always control, but still making sure, even if you have those feelings, you're willing to meet other people and just kind of mingle in different social mm. circles and Make sure the, the door is open for um, for anyone who might actually be ready and interested to start pursuing. It's a good idea. And then what about advice on the flip side for men? So you, this is good advice for what women can do to kind of up the opportunities to go on first dates and start getting to know different people to maximize the potential of getting married. What can men do? Ultimately, uh, they should really be probably asking more women out, um, which does take a lot of courage. It's going to cause some rejections. It's going to cause some anxieties and pain. And I, I thank the men out there for going through that for us most of the time. I really appreciate it. But I think a lot of women find it very, very attractive mm -hmm. when the man is willing to take a little risk mm -hmm. and take the direct approach and he has the confidence to pursue. So I would say men should be paying attention to those signals and also just whether or not you think you're getting the right signals, if you're really interested in women, just go for it. And it doesn't have to be any really big deal. You don't have to profess your undying love. You know, you really shouldn't do that. Just say, I'm really enjoying getting to know you. Can I take you out to coffee sometime or lunch, ice cream, whatever, you know, fill in the blank, some fun activity that's kind of lighthearted just as a starting point. And I think having something really specific like that, like may I take you to dinner is, is sort of time boxed. You're not saying, will you be my girlfriend right out the gate that might intimidate her? You're just saying, can I, can I treat you to something small to sort of get us started, get to know each other a little bit better? And I think from what I hear from women is that they wish that would happen to them more. They wish mm -hmm. more guys would just do that and then they can give them a chance and then both parties can just see how it goes. The very best way to start your day is with a steaming cup of coffee, but not just any coffee. You're going to want to drink seven weeks coffee because it is the most delicious coffee that you will ever taste. If you go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, you'll see all the different blends and roasts that they have, but this is low acid, gourmet, ethically sourced, small batch roasted, delicious coffee. It's what I love to drink in the morning and you're going to love it too. What I love about sevenweekscoffee.com is not only is it ethically sourced and the best beans, they use the top one to 2% of all 
beans in the world to make their coffee, but Seven Weeks Coffee also gives a full 10% of all their revenue directly back to the pro-life movement, to pregnancy resource centers. In fact, they are almost hitting the milestone with your help of a half a million dollars, $500,000 donated directly to help moms and babies in need. You can be a part of this by going to sevenweekscoffee.com today. You can pick your favorite subscription of your favorite blend of coffee. My favorite is the medium Ethiopian roast. And if you become a member of the Heartbeat Club, meaning you're going to get coffee delivered to your door every single month, you'll get a full 15% off your order. And if you use the code Lila at checkout, you'll get another 10% off your order for a full 25% off your first order of seven weeks coffee. So go right now to sevenweekscoffee.com, pick your favorite coffee blend, put in your order, use the code Lila at checkout for up to 25% off your first order. Know that you're not only drinking a delicious cup of steaming hot coffee in the morning, but you are supporting the pro-life movement, giving back 10% of everything that you order to help moms and babies in need. Go check them out today. That's sevenweekscoffee.com. You are going to love this coffee and you're going to love this mission just as much. I've heard some guys complain that they have tried to pursue women and they just get shut down or they are accused of being creepy or pursuing too Mm -hmm. hard. I mean, when I hear that, it makes me sad because whoever is accusing them of that, maybe he wasn't for you, but he might be for the next girl. So give him a give him a break. Like just tell him. And that's why, like I remember in my twenties when I was dating, I would always say thank you so much for honoring me by asking me, even if I'm Mm -hmm. not interested, I don't want to go out with you. Like it was truly honoring to do that. So I think it's also etiquette for women. What would you say though to the guy who's listening? Who's like, I'm I'm discouraged or yeah, uh, again. The one yes someday might make all the no's worth it. But I would also say, this is some tough feedback that sometimes not everyone wants to hear. But the number one complaint I heard from Catholic women about Catholic men is that a lot of them come across as just kind of awkward and boring. <laughs> like they don't have a lot of personality. And some of those They're same like, women- They're like, the priesthood didn't work out. I guess I'm going to get married now. Right. And <laughs> some of those same women said, I've tried dating non-Catholic guys who you know, are a lot more fun and just interesting to talk to, but I, I do want someone who shares my faith and values. So how do I navigate this? How, do I really have to choose between the two? So I think it's not necessarily that those guys are creepy or boring or anything. It's just that sometimes the multi- the, the multiple sides of their personalities aren't just coming out comfortably in social interactions somehow. So it takes some practice. Uh, same advice that I mentioned earlier for the women, as you're just going about your day, you know, chat a little bit with the cashier in just a friendly way, not because just people you're interested in. You know, you can get some practice mm-hmm. with just making conversation easily, but also look at your life and see whether it's well-rounded, see whether you are pursuing everything that God might be calling you to do, Mm. building up the talents that God has given you. How's your spiritual life? How's your physical life? So are you getting some form of exercise in, not just for health, but it's good for your personality too. If you go play pickup sports or take dancing classes or something like that, where you could also meet other people. Um, Do you have a social life that isn't just, I'm trying to date women, but (laughs) you know, (laughs) and this goes both ways too. There are women who just are so Mm. focused on dating that it becomes their whole personality. That's not good either, you know, but I think having just multiple interests that aren't Mm. just, I go to church on Sunday and then I go to work during the week and then maybe I go to young adult Bible study or something and try to meet people there. And then I go to a dating app and I try to ask someone out and there's just not much to talk about because I haven't basically done things or developed interests that women might also have that we could talk about together and go on dates that are related to that together. Read poetry and go scuba diving. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, anything. I mean, there's anything you might be interested in. There's probably that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, yeah. You had a chapter called You Don't Have a Type. And I yes. thought that it was such a good chapter because but I want you to explain it for people because what you weren't saying, you weren't saying not to have standards. You weren't saying not to have desires and interests. What were, what did you mean by you don't have a type? It was purposely a little bit of a blunt statement for the chapter title because I want to challenge people's thinking. Um, I had to challenge my own thinking on this. So this is very mm-hmm. much a personal <laughs> journey for me that I went through. I When I first met my husband, kind of completely dismissed him because I just didn't think he looked like my type, didn't think he acted like my type. It was sort of an initial just surface level judgment. You know, he has earrings and tattoos and just kind of a 
more like, outgoing I wear pearls. personality. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this just, it just wasn't the kind of guy I had ever dated before. And so I was, you know, sending those signals that I wasn't interested. And I'm so glad that he non creepily, gently just continued trying to get to know me. And that eventually God worked on my heart and brought me around to being more open because it turns out um, the type I had before. There's probably a reason it wasn't working out and I needed a new type. So I challenge people to have standards for whom you're going to marry. So mm -hmm. those big picture, really important things like shared faith or shared values, shared goals for your life. Um, you have to have some interests in common, something to talk about. Sure. You know, just be able to basically click and communicate well with each other. But any of those kind of smaller preferences, like, Height is always the stereotype. Women want someone who's 6'4", or whatever, you know. Uh, things like looks, um, even somewhat interests, hobbies, even slightly different flavors of the same faith, maybe. There are lots of things that I think we need to let go of, at least in the beginning stages, and be open to meeting people who don't fit all those criteria on the list. Be open to going on at least a first date with people who don't fit any criteria on the list and just get to know people step by step. So that then you can see, number one, are you actually more compatible with a different type of person than what you've always thought? And number two, is this difference you have with the other person actually a way that God wants to help you grow? Because I found that the differences between me and my husband were actually things that helped kind of balance each mm -hmm. other out. We're both growing. We're both learning every day. As a result of that, our relationship was instantly very good and very mm -hmm. healthy in part because we're a bit different in our personalities and those surface level differences like having tattoos versus not just didn't matter after like three dates. It, it really didn't. I found myself actually very attracted to him, even though he didn't look like the type that I had ever wanted to date before. So I are they face tattoos? No, <laughs> no, no, no. He told me that the, the meaning behind each one. Okay. And, you know, yes. You didn't have to be looking at them. I didn't know. Um, so one of the things that I, I love that you specifically mentioned in the book was that you, I talked about self-awareness and kind of getting to know yourself. And the more we grow in self-knowledge, the more we can be, I think, in a position to love better, quite frankly, um, and to be loved self-knowledge is a gift, but you, I think you had some comment in there somewhere about how even the person that's like maximally self-knowledge doubt, like they've discerned and prayed and matured and been mentored and all the things you're still not perfect in your self-knowledge. And that's why allowing other people to kind of rock your world a little bit and open up your, your horizons and in the way that they interact in the world. And we're not talking about morality right now. We're not talking about like moral issues and basic issues of faith. We're talking yes. about personality and preference and things like that. Uh, you might discover things you would have never known about yourself otherwise. Yes. I personally experienced in particular during my relationship with my husband, when we started dating some deep, ugly wounds in my soul, mm -hmm. I guess my, my mind were kind of bubbling up that I didn't mm -hmm. even know were there. It wasn't because he was doing anything to cause any wounds. It was because actually he was very good for me to be around. And I could see this is another way to be that's actually healthier. And it was such a gift to have that happen. And then just from being around him, he was very supportive of just kind of letting me heal, letting me navigate this, praying for me and supporting me during all of that. Um, I was able to heal from a lot of things very quickly and, and come out better. And even if we hadn't gotten married, that would have been such a gift. So mm -hmm. I think God very, very often uses relationships to kind of trigger something that he wants to do in us. And oftentimes that's because the person is a little different than what you had in mind. We don't always know what's actually going to make us happiest and holiest, but God knows best and he, he can just put the right person in your life at the right time. Okay, so what's your take on how to meet more people? And then also that's connected to online dating because a lot of people mm -hmm. are using apps today to just meet people. And I know a lot of success stories, quite frankly, of people who've met via apps, but I haven't ever met someone who likes online dating at the same time. <laughs> yeah, They all want to just meet them naturally. <laughs> so how do you meet more people naturally? And then how do you approach online dating in the best way? Mm, yeah, I say that both of those should be tools in your tool belt, so to speak. Um, I used to be more against online dating. I never wanted to do it myself. Luckily, never had to. <laughs> and the more I heard from people, the more it just sounded, I think I, what I say in the book, it, it sounds like the worst of shopping on Amazon <laughs> combined with 
you know, because you're putting all your filters on trying to find exactly the right person and then judging based on a picture. Like, and then it comes in is, and it's from China and you're like, what the heck just This happened? is what I asked for. Yeah. All they need is Plus reviews. Plus it costs like $100. Yeah. So you're like, what? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, yeah, not, not necessarily mm-hmm. a pleasant experience, but I did interview people who met that way and who have very happy marriages. And so I asked them, what did you do that worked? And I kind of came around to seeing it as definitely a good tool to have, but one that should be balanced out with also trying to meet people in person at the same time, because you don't want to just lose your social skills for one thing and be behind a screen all the time. But also you just don't know that there might be someone out there perfect for you who's in your city, who's just not on the same dating app. So I think doing both is good. Um, Online dating should actually just be online meeting. It should be the way you meet someone initially, and then you should bring that relationship into real life as soon as possible. And from there on, it progresses just like any natural relationship. It might be long distance, for example, but it's, I think it's not the end of the world if you're, how, how we met story is the internet, which might not be the most exciting thing, but it's, if it's the right person, then your life is going to be wonderful and you're never going to regret it. Um, as far as in-person But one, one quick second, well, you yeah. said something, I think that's really important in what you wrote in your book is get it off, off, off online as quickly as possible. Yes. And so that you're not wasting time constantly texting, messaging people mm-hmm. on an app. I mean, I thought that was a really interesting point because I think a lot of people, there's like this long lead time where they have this like months go by with this casual communication. But you actually put the clamp down on that in the book and you're like, what, what, what do you have to say to that for yes. now online dating? I think the danger with lots of texting, and this is actually a piece of advice that I, I got from um, a Catholic psychologist. His name is Dr. Greg Bataro. He has a really nice list of seven rules for online dating, and he called it online meeting. Online dating is a misnomer. He says mm. it should be online meeting. And he recommends being very open to you know any messages you get, any likes or swipes or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, Be very open to all these people at first. But he, I think, he gives kind of a timeline. Like It should be no more than maybe three days or so mm. of just texting or emailing, you know, written messages before you move to a phone call, and it should be no more than a week or two before you move to an in-person mm. date. And I really appreciate that kind of time limit because I, I do run into people who seem like they're in this sort of halfway state where they're, I, I'm talking to someone online, but he's all the way in a different state. And it sounds to me sometimes like maybe the other person just isn't making enough of an effort to actually meet up in person. And not to be hard on the guys, but I particularly dislike that when it's the guy who isn't saying can I drive to you? Can we meet halfway? Can, you know, can we do something so we can actually meet in person? Because you just don't fully know somebody until you see them in the flesh, Mm -hmm. you see how they actually interact in real life. I think video calls are the the best, second best. Um, You can at least tell that this person probably is who they say they are and they're not totally (laughs) catfishing you, which is helpful, but it's still not the same. Um, And it's, Something a friend said to me a long time ago that has stuck with me is that communication is not a relationship. It's part of a relationship and it's an important part, but eventually just talking isn't enough. You actually need to have experiences together. Mm. So it's good. going on dates is just fun little experiences and you can see how people interact with other people around and in different settings. They can meet your friends, they can meet your family when it's time for all of that. I think all of that is really important. And if you just talk online for a really long time, you might get very emotionally invested. And then when you finally meet in person, you might just get, <laughs> get just a weird feeling. Like, this like person, what have I exactly, done? <laughs> like, like ordering the thing from Timu or whatever. <laughs> it's not what you thought. Or, or they might be exactly what they presented themselves as. It might not be any deception on their part, but just, I don't know if it's, it's a, it's a biological thing maybe that you just don't feel right around this mm-hmm. person. And that's something you have to listen to as well. Whereas if you met in person, you would know that pretty quickly. So I think it's a good tool, but we do have to sort of put a time limit on how much happens on the internet before just making it uh, incarnational might be a nice theological word for it. Bring it into real life, have your, your body language and being in the same room be a part of your relationship as soon as you can. Even if it's long distance, just making that effort early on is going to be worth it. It's really good. We have that rule over at one of my organizations, Live Action. We always meet in person before we make a job offer. Mm-hmm. And we're remote staff. It's not like that needs to happen, but we need, it needs to happen because there's so much yeah. that you learn in person, not Zoom, not FaceTime, like an in-person meeting to understand and get to know someone yeah, properly. Absolutely. 
And for dating, it's all the more important. Yes. Okay. Your, your you, marriage is not going to be online. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are going to go into next how to uh, increase opportunities to meet people. Like where where can you where do you recommend people go in real life to meet people? It's, I always got frustrated when I would see people. So often it's on Reddit or somewhere on the internet saying, "Where do I meet my spouse?" I just I can't seem to find anybody. And the only advice anybody ever seems to give is try Catholic Match again for Catholics, or try a dating app, <laughs> or uh, just talk Christian to people at mingle, church. I think it is, yeah. right? <laughs> just talk to people at church. And of course, the response is maybe I've tried those things already and it's not working. So there are a lot of maybe lesser known ways that I recommend people kind of branch out and meet people. Um, just the other day, I heard that there's this organization called Catholic Sports that runs just kind of casual recreational sports leagues in a bunch of, kind of uh, cities around the country. And they're saying that over 100 couples have met and gotten married through it even though that's not their core mission at all. <laughs> I've heard similar things about young Catholic professionals. They're doing sort of professional development and networking and faith formation and all these wonderful things. And they're not meant to be a dating service, but people do just organically meet through going to a happy hour that they're putting on or something like that, or at their conference that they have once a year. So looking for things like that, that are maybe not just limited to your parish or your immediate neighborhood, or just sort of the paths you're usually running in, but you have some other interest or some other reason you'd want to be there anyway, and you're going to meet some like-minded people that way is always a good idea. Uh, there's infinite numbers of those things. Um, again, it could be a grocery store parking lot. It could be anywhere, <laughs> but I'm also a big fan of putting on dedicated singles events, which some people really don't like the sound of that. They think it's going to be really awkward. I, but I used to run mixers and speed dating events in Nashville. And um, I've since handed off the ministry to someone else, but we ran about three speed dating events over the course of six months. Now there are, I believe, three marriages and two more engagements nice that can be work. traced to just those. Did you charge for that? We would charge just <laughs> enough to cover the venue, that kind of thing. I wanted it to be nonprofit. nonprofit. You know? <laughs> uh, and the first event, I was trying to participate in it and run it at the same time. And it was absolute chaos, but mm. that's what got me to go on a date with my husband. So I'm very grateful. <laughs> very, very cool. Yes. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately, like Pampers and Huggies are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with everylife. Everylife.com is not only a best-in-class product for babies, but it also also loves babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to everylife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. So. And then you had also some advice for just even presentation. And I want to just include mm -hmm. that really quick here, like how people should think about dress I think a lot of times today people will go out of the house just dressed like they're going to the gym. It's kind of a typical thing. And if you're going to the gym, you should be dressed like you're going to the gym, right? What's your take on dress? Right. I think it's a good exercise um, to just everywhere you go, present yourself in a way that you wouldn't be totally embarrassed if you met a really cute guy or girl <laughs> that you might be interested in. You know, Think about uh, just being mindful of you know, unless you are going to the gym or something like that, where you need to look more casual or be sweaty, whatever, you know, that's fine. But thinking about that mm -hmm. before just going anywhere, because you really never know where you're going to meet someone. And it just gets you kind of in practice. It helps you build maybe a wardrobe that you should have anyway of clothes that actually look nice on you. Thinking about what colors and silhouettes mm -hmm. actually bring out the best of your God-given beauty or your God-given good looks, uh, I think is is such a good thing to do. And we don't often... Um, think about that unless we're specifically going to something where 
we, we really want to make a good impression on people. Why not make a good impression all the time, you know? <laughs> I love that. And I, I think, too, everyone, some people might be listening, were like, well, I, you know, I want to just be comfortable or, well, I'm just not, maybe some people don't feel they're that attractive. But the reality is I think anyone who's seeking health and who's taking care of themselves is attractive. Yes. And if you're meant to get married, you will absolutely be attractive to the person that God yes. may place in your path. So yes, just don't put barriers in the way of exactly. looking attractive, you know, exactly. And I do think you can also look nice and be very comfortable at the same time by just kind of finding the right things that fit well, and maybe the right materials for the weather that you're going to be in that kind of thing can go a long way. Um, the internet is actually such a gift in the clothes shopping department, at Amazon. least to me. It's like, yeah, you can no, search no, for not, exactly not what you want. It's great. All right. So you have another chapter called The Non-Exclusive Stage. Who says you shouldn't date around? And this was maybe one of your more controversial chapters, but yes. you basically recommend going on dates with multiple people for a period of time and not doing one and done dating, meaning you're just going, just pursuing one person at a time, basically pursuing potentially multiple people at a time. Yes. Including for men to do that. Yes. And I definitely Why? get the most, uh, pushback or at least questions on that point versus anything else that I say in the book, which is interesting. But I think what I found for myself was that it was very easy to get really over committed to someone very quickly and it, it seemed like every relationship was kind of all or nothing. Either we weren't going to date at all, or I was all in emotionally by like date three. And then it was really, really hard if it ended. And it led me to, you know, kind of retreat into a period of singleness so that I could heal from that before moving on to someone else. And after a while, I, I mean, it's exhausting. I kinda, yeah, it's exhausting. And mm. it, it's not efficient, for lack of a better word. You know, it's like I spent years and years kind of in this cycle. And sometimes the only reason that happens is because we're dating out of sort of a sense of scarcity. Like this is the only person that I'm interested in or that I can possibly imagine meeting right now that I might be interested in. And so I kind of have to make this work even if it's really not working. Whereas if you can allow yourself to sort of be open to multiple people, sometimes that really helps you just naturally see who actually is a better fit for you more quickly and, and just relax a little bit and let it happen organically. Just get to know people a little bit at a time. It's okay for the relationship to be kind of shallow at first because that's a preparation for going deeper. If we meet a new friend, we don't immediately just pour out everything in our heart and soul and get super invested in that person because that's just not natural. It's much more human actually to kind of ease in bit by bit. And then at any point, it's pretty easy to just ease back out if you realize this isn't going to work and you don't want to go further. So I have heard from multiple different experts, you know, matchmakers, priests, lots of people that it's a great idea to take up to about three months to get to know someone before deciding you're in an exclusive relationship with that person and that you're actively discerning marriage. And I think that's especially true if you are meeting online or even just in kind of the young professional world where you don't see someone every day at school or anything like that. If you go, go from strangers to we are discerning marriage within less than a month. That just seems like a little too much too mm -hmm. soon uh, for your emotions. And it can also lead to kind of difficulties or temptations with well, how much physical expression should we have of this relationship mm -hmm. right now when we don't actually know each other that well. So I think easing in for up to three months, giving yourself that roughly 90 day time frame where you're challenging yourself not to be all or nothing, mm -hmm. just take one date at a time. That doesn't mean you have to go for 90 days. If you know sooner than that, that it's a no, it's a no. And that's fine but not being exclusive for at least two months, ultimately about three I was, was sort of the ideal that I kept hearing. And I should say, some people hear this and they're thinking, I can't even find one person to date. How in the world would I date <laughs> multiple people for three whole months? Read Rachel's book. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. But I, I definitely hear from a lot of men in particular that they just, they get interested in one woman at a time and they can't really imagine themselves like planning dates and paying for dates for multiple girls at once. And that's fine. I don't think people should force themselves to date five people at once. But I think the goal really is to be clear about your commitment level. So your commitment level is, is at a non-exclusive level for a few months. So if you happen to meet someone else that you were interested in one month into this first dating connection, it would be okay to go out with them if you wanted to. If you don't want to, that's fine. 
but you can also give the other person the space to maybe not be exclusive with you, even if you're not interested in anyone else. So it's mutual and that needs to be communicated. That needs to be done very respectfully. But uh, I think that it just keeps you from from getting too deep, either emotionally or physically and getting too committed. If you just have the mindset, like maybe someone else will cross my path. I'm not sure if this person is it yet. Um, yeah, up to two or three months. And then I think for most people naturally by that point, you know, if you really want to go deeper with this person, really discern marriage. And ironically, I think people, at least this is my experience. My husband and I, I, I started dating him when I was also seeing other people. He was just sort of one of the, the mix at that time after the speed dating event. And even though we took a while to become boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, put that label on it, start meeting each other's families, all those things. Once we were boyfriend and girlfriend, we were exclusive we only had to date really a few more months before we knew we wanted to get married. So it actually seemed to speed up the whole time frame because I knew he was the right person. We had entered into the re relationship very intentionally. Some people see sort of casual dating and dating around as the opposite of intentional, mm -hmm. but I think you can be intentionally casual or in intentionally keep things a little more shallow and just ease into it step by step. And that can actually be a very good thing for your discernment. I think that's great. So instead of starting fast and then slowing down and getting in a limbo, you know, there's these stories yes. of people that date for years and years and years. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, usually very painful often for the woman in that scenario, you're recommending actually start really slow. Mm -hmm. And then once things have lined up and you've really had the time to get to know them, then going fast is fine. But yes. take that time to get to know each other. You had a chapter that was called The Exclusive Stage, Deal Breakers and Discernment. What are the red flags? What should be the deal breakers? Yeah, I, I want to say first, there was a really interesting point that I heard from, again, uh, another Catholic psychologist that I interviewed for the book. His name is Dr. Brian Violet. Um, he said, sometimes something that's a red flag for one couple, meaning an absolute deal breaker for one couple, isn't necessarily for another. It might be more of a yellow flag or something you need to work through, which was interesting because sometimes we think, you know, certain things are just <laughs> are just too much, but some somebody else could work with it. Red flags would be if you disagree. Um, I'm actually stealing these from matchmaker Christina <laughs> Pineda, but it's just good advice. If you disagree on whether or not you want to have children, there's really no compromise on that one. <laughs> and, and how soon should you be talking with the person that you're dating about those things, like whether or not they want to have children? I, I think you shouldn't force it out on a first date. Sometimes it comes out naturally mm -hmm. and that's okay, but... Definitely I, by three or four. I think three or four. If you're a question marked about that, right. like, oh, does this person even want to have kids? Maybe don't keep exactly. wasting your Usually time. Usually <laughs> people will naturally mention something like, oh, with my future kids someday, I hope, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's great. And so... You can also just say, I love kids and then yeah, see what yeah. they do. Or say, I, I, like, really, I hope to have too. a big family. <laughs> just like share yeah. your own yeah. side of it and see how they react. So you don't have to be super interviewy about yeah. it. Like, do you want 12 children? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it should come out within a few days. I think um, similarly, just because you might be dating someone who's a fellow Christian or a fellow Catholic does not necessarily mean that marriage is a very important goal for them mm. or that they're planning to be ready to get married within the same time frame that you are. So hopefully allowing some of that to come mm. out in those first few dates is a good idea. Um, if you have to just straight up ask by date four or five, like not not asking you to marry me, but are you know like are you planning on getting married within the next couple of years or, or you know how's that going to go for you? I, that can be so frustrating if you are maybe you're the woman you're saying I have a biological clock that's ticking and I'd really like to be married within the next say three years or whatever, and the other person is like, oh I have career plans that are going to take seven years. I'm in no rush. You know, it, you don't want to learn that way down the road. So basically, marriage being an important goal, roughly the same time frame. Do you both want children? Even if you don't have a specific number on it or anything. Um, and it and is then, amazing, yeah. I will say, like in culture, how many, in our today's culture, how many people seem to be okay with these endless relationships. I remember in college, yeah. I had a boyfriend at one point and we were, I mean, boyfriend's a strong word, but we were eventually boyfriend and girlfriend after dating casually for a few months. And, but the, the exclusive relationship was very short because I asked him, I was like, you know, I could kind of tell that even though he was really into the relationship, that there didn't seem to be longevity for him in mm -hmm. terms of a life plan beyond college, really. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, do, when do you see yourself getting married? Was the question that I remember asking him. And he was like, 
I don't know, I just had maybe in a few years, I'm not sure. And I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> I was like, what am I doing dating yeah, you? I mean, yeah. I think you're awesome, but I'm going to peace out pretty quick here because this, this is not, I'm not around to just date you for five years. You know, you're an amazing yeah. person, but if you both have certain goals you're working toward, like you're still in school or something like that, and your timelines are going to kind of align, mm -hmm. then it probably makes a lot of sense. But if you are, um, maybe one person really has their life together, ready to go. And the other person might just be kind of floundering a little bit more and, and isn't sure where they're headed or how long it's going to take. If there's really no, no time limit on it mm -hmm. whatsoever, you know, um, then I think more often that could be problematic. Um, but I, as always, I would come back to pray and consider carefully and just take it one step at a time. Cause you can't really uh, put a blanket rule on that, I think, either way. All right. There's a lot more in the book, but I want to get to one last topic before we close out today. And this has been so fun. <laughs> you have a chapter called When Should We Kiss? And uh, the chastity talk, I wish I heard as a teen. This is something I'm very passionate about talking about. We actually did a whole series over at Live Action called The Truth About Sex because I think the extremes of purity culture on the one hand and some of the messages that came through, whether inadvertently or on purpose and then the culture's excess like sex whatever you want as long as there's consent you're good there's no meaning beyond that it can be two unhealthy extremes what do you think what are your uh, what is the chastity talk that you wish you'd heard as a teen yeah I wish I had been given more of a just a complete picture. I think sometimes the chastity advice that we're giving to younger Christians is a long list of don'ts. You know, it's don't do this before marriage and uh, mostly just don't have sex before marriage. That's, that's the, the biggest uh, message that comes across. And then sometimes you'll hear something like, and don't go too far with kissing or other things too. But it was very difficult, at least for me growing up, to get the, the chastity speaker or whoever was giving the advice to say anything about what too far actually meant. Well, then they'd say, <laughs> if you're asking how far is exactly. too far, then you're going too far. Right, that's <laughs> the like, I'm question. not even dating anyone yeah. right now. What like, are you talking about? I'm definitely about? not going too far. And I tended <laughs> yeah. toward uh, the kind of anxiety and scrupulosity yeah. sometimes in this area, and I think a lot of people do. So <laughs> then you start thinking whoever touches another person the least <laughs> before marriage is the holiest, and that's what we're all striving for. And that's just also not true and not human and not what God says. <laughs> so what I lay out in the book is here's what uh, the Catholic Church teaches us. Here's what God actually says. This is what we can learn about our bodies and sex and everything from scripture and tradition. Also, here's all the rules that they don't say. You know, God didn't give us these commandments. The church doesn't teach this. And so there's no just rule, make up rules. There's you know? no rule in the Bible not to kiss before marriage. Right. You know, there's room for prudence and our own good judgment in this area. So I think we need to emphasize that. You know, there are some things that people might advise, but it's just advice. You can decide if it's helpful or not. It might be very good advice that most people should take, but that's not the same as it being God's commandments, right? Um, that being said, I do hear some very good advice from people I listed in the book. Um, again, Another psychologist, Dr. Mario Sacasa, uh, has a, a really good online course actually called Dating Well, where he goes through lots of different topics, but he talks about physical affection and chastity. And he says, okay, if sex is off limits, that means anything that would very directly lead to sex or put you in a big position of temptation is also off limits. So keeping all your clothes on, not touching certain body parts, you know, <laughs> I won't get too detailed there, but you know, use a little common sense. Um, some things should just not happen before marriage, even if it's not full on sex. It just doesn't make sense because it's preparatory to the marriage act. But things like kissing, hand holding, kind of when that's appropriate. I think the most important principle that I would give people is um, one that actually St. John Paul II articulates. He, he goes much deeper into it and uses very philosophical language that I find a little hard to understand. But ultimately what he says is, Physical affection should be the expression of an existing relationship, not the cause of your attachment. Mm. So That's good. at every stage of a relationship, you have a certain amount of relationship there that can be expressed in some way physically that's very appropriate. So I, I provide stories in the book of people who either kissed on their first date because actually they knew each other pretty well by then. They had been friends before. They had already said, I love you. 
And this was just a way that, you know, they expressed their relationship and it was perfectly fine for them and they have no regrets. But a lot of people probably shouldn't kiss on a first date because they're not actually at that point in the relationship yet. So it's not God's law, but it just might not be the most prudent thing to do. Um, it can just kind of mess with your discernment, kind of cause those attachments to form too quickly when you don't really have the foundation and friendship and really knowing about the person yet. So I think that's yeah. true too with even like cuddling. I, I've mm -hmm. heard from a lot of wonderful Catholic young men and women that I've talked to about dating. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's like, well, if it's like sort of chaste cuddling, it's not like sexual, but you're like, you know, getting cozy with them, but you're just starting to date. And that becomes like this whole part of your relationship. You're just yes. like cuddling all the time. It's like, that's, that's not, I mean, yeah, maybe it's not overtly wrong or sexual or anything like that. But the point there is, is your relationship a cuddle ship? I mean, it sounds kind of nice, I guess, but that's why you should get married and have kids and then you can cuddle your kids. But that's not discerning or really getting to know them. That's yes. like a very expensive security blank, like physical blanket <laughs> that you could get on Amazon right, instead right. of it being and this human being that you're kind of using for oxytocin. Yes. The use is really a big part of the problem there. Even if that's not intentional, like, oh, I'm using right. this person, but what are you really getting? You're just getting a lot of oxytocin and like good feelings, mm -hmm. but you, 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 the goal here is to really get to know this person, their soul, like understand them, discern. Yeah. Do you want to keep getting to know them deeper, more deeply towards marriage? So yeah. it's easy, I think, to get lost along the way. Absolutely. And, and sometimes in our modern American culture, especially young single adults can be very starved for physical mm, affection. That's a good point. Some, you know, if you're not living with your family, then maybe you're not getting hugs all the time. There's no babies and, around. Yeah. So sometimes we really crave <laughs> that maybe for, for good reasons, but we're just mm. trying to get all of it from the person we've just started dating. Mm. And so I, I would recommend having, uh, you know, close friends and family and babies around as much as possible. Kind of, yeah. hug them. <laughs> exactly. Like those are perfectly safe ways to, mm -hmm. to express affection and get your oxytocin boost without being sexual at all. And then with the person you're dating, you're not putting all the pressure on them to provide that, you know, or, what? or causing them maybe deeper heartbreak if mm -hmm. you break up because they did get really bonded mm -hmm. to you through this physical touch. So um, I think we're not, also scared yeah. of sexualizing touch today. Touch is yes. so sexualized today. Yes. And so we're like afraid of hugging the old person. We're afraid of hugging a friend. We're afraid of like patting someone on the back or, I mean, physical mm -hmm. touch has become so, I think, taboo in many ways, which is really sad. Yes. And so we're all starving for it. Mm -hmm. And then maybe it, it, it means we kind of create these outlets for it that are not as healthy or normal. Exactly. Yeah. There's a really interesting book that I, I briefly mentioned in mine and an article yeah. she's written too. She, she talks about this um, reality of being touch starved or, yes. or skin hunger and how a lot of people in the hookup culture are hooking up because they just want to be touched and yeah. be, be close to someone. Mm. And then they realize I didn't, I didn't really want sex all that much. <laughs> I just wanted someone near me. <laughs> I wanted to share a bed with someone basically. And that's so sad, you know? Mm. And so maybe as Christians, we, maybe we've decided we're not going to participate in that, but it can be so easy to sort of do the same thing in yeah. a different way. Yeah. So it's really good. Okay. Um, last question. And this was the last chapter, the engagement stage. And, you know, there's obviously so much more we could talk about, but we're going to end here. When you are discerning whether or not to get married and then you, you make the leap, you're engaged, what would you say is the most important thing you should do with an engagement? Prepare for your marriage, not just your wedding. Because I think it's so, so easy to get so caught up in the details of your wedding plan. I, I definitely felt that temptation myself. Um, my now husband and I, we had to set boundaries for ourselves at a certain point because if we talked, we were talking about the wedding for the longest time. And we eventually decided to have a couple of dates where we would say, all right, we're going to knock out this one piece of wedding planning and we're going to be done with it by a certain time. <laughs> and then we're not talking about the wedding for the rest of the evening. We're not touching on that at all. We're going to just focus on our relationship and keep our relationship healthy and thriving. And I think that's really good practice for marriage too, because mm -hmm. you're going to get caught up in work and kids and everything else and you need to still focus on each other. So that's the number one thing. It's nice to have a nice wedding, but ultimately so much is stuff that nobody, none of the guests, maybe not even you will remember in a year, you know, like exactly what the centerpieces looked mm -hmm. like is, is lovely and all, but it doesn't really matter that much. You can just kind of let it happen and it'll be okay. Focus on the fact that you're entering this very important covenant, this sacrament that 
you're, you're going before God and your community <laughs> to get married. That's the focus. All the other details of the day are, are maybe worth talking about a little bit, but not too much. Amen. Awesome. Rachel, you're awesome. Where can people find your book? Uh, prettygoodcatholic.com that goes straight to the publisher's website. It also has the whole table of contents and a little sample for people to read. So uh, if you want to check that out, um, and it is also available on Amazon, there's a Kindle version and all of that. Awesome. Thanks for this gift that you've given to a lot of people. I really think it's going to help a lot of people. Wonderful. Way to go. Well, thanks be to God <laughs> and for on opening your, the doors. And congrats on your family. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel Thank is you six so months much. pregnant. You can't tell, but I'm very excited for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to share this episode with your friends, especially their single friends who might need this advice and this encouragement. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. That's how we reach more people. And if you're not already part of our Locals community, go right now to the link in the bio, locals.com, and become part of the Lila Rose podcast community. And if you become a paying subscriber, we will send you some very cool stuff. Check that out at the link in the bio, and we'll see you next time. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.